Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, I hope you're not that tired. Come on, let's keep it going here. I, I am Ruth Katz, the Executive Director of the Health Medicine Society program here at the Aspen Institute. In my spare time, I serve as co-director of Spotlight Health. Um, so we're delighted to have you here. I hope you've had a great time so far. You're going to have a great panel this afternoon, and we're delighted that everybody's here. My job is to simply introduce our moderator, who in turn will introduce the panel, give a little bit of background. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Margot Sanger Katz, no relation, <laughs> but a very dear friend. Margot is a domestic correspondent at the New York Times, where she writes about health care for the upshot, the Times site for politics, economics, and everyday life. Before joining the Times in 2014, she had a fellowship in economics and business journalism at Columbia University. Um, she previously served as a healthcare reporter for the National Journal and the Concord Monitor and an editor for Legal Affairs Magazine and at the Yale Alumni Magazine. She's also a regular guest. I hope some of you were down to see her on the, uh, for the Kaiser Health News' weekly What the Health podcast. She was just, so she's been pretty busy down there with the podcast as well. In any event, it's my great pleasure to turn the program over to Margo. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ruthie, and uh, welcome, everyone. So we are here to talk about technology in firearms and the ways that smarter guns and smarter firearm detection uh, could help reduce the public health toll of firearm violence. And I have a really wonderful panel of people uh, who are coming at this from a variety of perspectives. Uh, immediately beside me is Donald Zilka, who is the founder of Zilka Partners and who is the former chairman of Colt, the firearm manufacturer. Uh, in the center here is another Margo, which is a nice treat for me. Um, <laughs> Margo Hirsch, uh, who is the president of Smart Tech Challenges Foundation, uh, who's working to help develop some of these new technologies to make guns a little bit safer. And uh, all the way to my right is Ralph Clark, who's the president and CEO of Shot Spotter, which is a publicly traded company that is working on detecting um, shootings in cities, and he'll tell us more about that. Um, I wanted to start with just a really basic question um, for Margot, which is, what is a smart gun? Because I think it's a term that is talked about uh, without a lot of specificity, and I think is a term that we are going to talk about. So it would be good to just have some understanding of what that means. Sure. A smart gun is a firearm that has a safety feature that only allows it to be fired by an authorized user. The technologies that we see being um, developed currently are either biometric technologies, which reads your fingerprint, or RFID, um, radio frequency, and that's the technology that's used in like your key fob to unlock your car. And the concept behind user authorized firearms and safety devices is that if an authorized user is only allowed to use the firearm, then the firearm can't be misused. And misused in the sense of suicide, um, stolen and used against you, stolen and used in future crimes, or an accidental death. So it's employing technology to help prevent uh, an array of uh, firearm injuries and deaths. Donald, so you, uh, your company, uh, Colt, when you were there, uh, was one of the early innovators in trying to develop this kind of technology. And I know it was a little bit of a rocky experience. So uh, there were sort of, as I understand it, technical challenges, technological challenges, but also some kind of political and market challenges. And I just was hoping you could tell us a little bit of that story and what you've learned from that. Sure. Um, I was fortunate enough to uh, be chairman of Colt for 19 years. Um, uh, I took the company out of bankruptcy, um, not because I was uh, um, a big fan of handguns. I'd never shot a handgun when I bought the company. Um, but my partners and I, one of whom is in this room right now with me, um, decided that it was a tremendous name. It was part of our history. Um, Colt uh, was responsible really for the development of our machine tool industry. Pratt & Whitney came out of Colt, Smith & Wesson, Winchester, the first typewriter, American writing machine. Um, so with that background, and firsts in handguns, and from the beginning, with the first revolver, and then John Browning ser sent, served, uh, sold his invention of the 1911 to Colt, and then Gene Stoner, the uh, M16, Colt had always been at the cutting edge. So 
I, we took the company out of bankruptcy. We were in a, um, um, a difficult position because we didn't have a lot of money. And we wanted to do something innovative that would help and change perhaps the perspective um, in the industry. And the first thing we came out with in 1996 was the idea of a smart gun. And it was going to be called the iColt because remember in those days everything was I. <laughs> <laughs> So it, it was. Like <laughs> so so we had uh, we had the um, the I cult started and the NRA came to me and said you know it's not a great idea. Um, he said because it's going to really impact Second Amendment rights and we said don't be silly. Um, it's just another opportunity, and it's the future. So you know get used to it. Well, the truth is a year later. Um, New Jersey enacted the um, uh, Childproof Handgun um, um, Act, um, which basically stated that once a proper smart gun came out and could be commercially produced, within three years, anybody selling guns in New Jersey had to sell only smart guns. So I apologize to the, to the, um, the, the NRA. That's not mine, I don't think. No. I apologize to the... Uh, to the NRA, and we continue to develop the gun despite. Um, smart guns were a challenge in those days. Biometric for us meant um, fingerprints. And every time you shoot a handgun, you create an explosion. So to get the sensor to stay on to your handgun, uh, to your fingerprint, was a difficult uh, task. So we moved fairly quick, quickly to something called RFID, which was radio frequency. Like when you put your key down in your car and you press a button with your foot on the brake, um, that's an RFID um, sort of idea. And we, we created a gun that basically spoke to that. Um, the fact is it was a stillborn project uh, from the beginning. And as time went on, th four years later, we realized it, and I think later on we'll, we'll discuss other reasons so I can let somebody else. Oh, sure, speak. of course, yeah. yeah. So, Ralph, uh, your technology is quite different, but is also a use of technology to try to get at gun violence. So I was hoping just you could tell us a little bit about ShotSpotter's work. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, first, for having me. Um, so ShotSpotter provides a acoustic gunshot detection surveillance technology that's used by cities. Uh, we deploy network sensors in a coverage area, and these sensors are designed to ignore ambient noise, but to recognize the um, impulsive event that discharging a firearm or gun uh, creates. And when that sound emanates out, it'll hit each sensor at a slightly different time, and we're able to use the time differential along with the location differential of each of those network sensors to be able to triangulate or pinpoint the uh, firearm activity or the, the discharge of a weapon. And we're doing this within 30 to 45 seconds of the trigger uh, being pulled. So it detects, locates, and then alerts a law enforcement uh, agency of outdoor gunfire. And we're focused on the criminal use of gunfire. We're not really particularly interested in illegal possession or criminal possession. We're really about the criminal use of uh, weapons in many at-risk, underserved communities that are dealing with ongoing, persistent gunfire. Yeah, can I what, for a second? Yes. Can differentiate between those two things. What's the difference between illegal gun possession and illegal gun use? Yeah, so illegal gun use is very straightforward. It's when you discharge a weapon. Okay. Um, and in most cities, um, that's a criminal act. Uh, sometimes it's a misdemeanor, sometimes it's a little bit more serious. Uh, hopefully it's, you know, more serious in more, in more cities because uh, when you discharge a weapon, of course, uh, you have the potentiality of hurting or killing uh, someone. And what we know from our work in uh, cities, we're deployed in about 100 cities here in the U.S., and we have one deployment in Cape Town, South Africa, is that the vast majority of persistent ongoing gun violence, believe it or not, goes underreported by the residents that are in those communities. Uh, and by underreporting, I mean 80 to 90 percent of the time when a gun is fired, there's no call to 911, which means there's no police response, which means that gun violence becomes normalized in these communities. And the other thing that we know from our work is that it's very few individuals that drive most of the gun crime. So this is really a Pareto optimum story on steroids in a way. Um, Oakland, California, which is where I'm from, I live in Oakland right now, born and raised, it's estimated there's probably about 15 to 20 people that are responsible for about 60 to 70% of the gun violence that goes on in these uh, at-risk communities. 
So what we're about is helping uh, police departments become more aware of and more accountable to these incidents, be able to uh, direct a very precise and hopefully quick law enforcement intervention uh, to these events in order to be able to um, interview witnesses, collect physical forensic evidence in the form of shell casings, which could be very helpful in downstream prosecutions, but most importantly, uh, signal to a at-risk underserved community that they matter. Because the thing that we all know is that when a gun is fired in a nice neighborhood, there's no question about response. And so we're trying to make sure that there's a um, uh, aspect of uh, public safety equity, I would say, to these uh, underserved communities that aren't effectively getting their fair share of uh, public service or public safety uh, services from police departments because they're not responding to these incidents. So um, I wanted to ask a question that Margo suggested that I ask, um, which is how many people in this audience have a gun or have fired a gun? I, 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 I think those are two questions. All right, how many people own a gun? And how many people have fired a gun? Okay, so this is a crowd that has some familiarity with this product. <laughs> no, now we're gonna now we're gonna we're gonna have uh, subgroups. <laughs> she just identified that. There's a big point between well a pistol or shotgun. All right, all right. Hey, let's not let's not lose control here, guys. We will ask that question to you. How many how many have shot a handgun or own a handgun? Shot. Shot. Okay. Um, so this is a good opportunity for me to also say that there will be an opportunity for questions at the end, so store them up. Um, <laughs> It occurs to me that a lot of the political conversation recently and, and the public health conversation around guns has really focused on mass shootings because we've had a number of really bad ones lately. Um, but they obviously represent a very small minority of gun deaths in the United States. And uh, there are a lot of other different kinds of deaths that are much more prevalent. So suicide is the most common kind of gun death. And then we also have homicides and uh, accidental shootings, uh, as Margo was talking about, where you know someone might accidentally fire a weapon and harm themselves or harm, harm someone else. So I'm wondering, when you guys think about the technologies that you're working on and that you're interested in, um, what are the kinds of gun deaths that they are best targeted towards? What, it, what are these technologies designed to reduce? Because it's not all of those things, right? Correct. You want to go? Okay. <laughs> so gun violence, as we know, is a very multifaceted, complex, and polarizing issue in this country. Um, there is no one silver bullet. Um, in terms of these technologies, they're really focused on addressing suicides and accidental deaths, and we even narrow it from there to teen youth suicides and children involved in unintentional uh, shootings. The reason for that is because when you look at access to firearms, there are 4.6 million loaded and unlocked guns in homes today, and that's a very recent updated statistic. Um, and when it comes to suicides, 2,600 kids under the age of 24 commit suicide every year, and about plus or minus 72% use a family member's gun. So if you can prevent a child from accessing that gun, you will prevent the suicide in most cases because studies have shown that suicide is highly impulsive. What m many people don't know is that 90% of people who attempt suicide and fail never go on to commit suicide again. But the problem with guns is that they're highly lethal. You know, means matters. If you use pills, your chances are you're not gonna die. But if you use a gun, chances are very good, 90%, that you will die. So if you can break the cycle in that moment, you can prevent the suicide. So we focus on youth suicides and then the accidentals where the four-year-old finds daddy's gun uh, under the bed, in the, uh, on the kitchen counter. I mean, it's very common for gun owners to lock up all their guns except for one for quick and easy access. So the idea behind these technologies, it allows gun owners to keep that one gun out of the safe and even loaded, but secured, so no one can have access to um, that firearm. And additional to those two, over time, it will disrupt the market for stolen guns. That's a longer time horizon, but if someone breaks into your home and steals your 
personalized gun, they won't be able to use it. They can try to hack it, but they'll ruin the gun and it'll be rendered useless. So, so just to put it also in context of size in terms of what we're talking about, there are 300 million guns in the United States. And um, interestingly enough, in the early 70s, 50% of the households had guns. Currently, 33% of those households own the 300 million guns. And three out of that 33% own half of them. So the market is toward collectors. These guys are, aren't you know, keeping guns on their walls so that they, they're not arming a militia. They're owning these guns, and probably out of the guns that are really shootable and serviceable, it'd be generous to say that 200 million, maybe 150 million, or so the others are antiques or they're, you know, they're collectibles and that's it. So you have to really frame it that way. That's, I think, the first thing. Um, and if you look at it in that context, and you also take a look at suicides, suicides were, I think, 10 years ago, 30,000, and I think they're now 45,000. And there seems to be at least a push. People who want to commit suicide do it, and obviously guns facilitate it, but guns are not, you know, they're becoming less significant, I'd say, in, on an absolute basis. The other thing you have to say is, um, I think mass shootings represent 1% of um, firearms deaths uh, every year. So it's a very small percentage. And generally speaking, the shooter is not dealing with a stolen gun. He owned or she owns the gun. Um, it's all been acquired legally, and, or at least unless, you know, in the case of Newtown, um, you know, the son, you know, stole it and that was it. But those guns had been acquired by the mother legally. So that's just to frame things. Rob, I know, I know you, you wanted to talk a little bit about some of the effects of gun violence that are not direct and that your technology might help disrupt. Sure. So I think um, it's, it's really important for folks to understand that gun violence does not, in terms of criminal gun violence, does not equal homicides or even gunshot wound victims. Um, in fact, uh, we know that guns are probably fired 100 times for every homicide. Um, and there is a real issue with, I'll call it vicarious victimization that takes place in these communities that are dealing with ongoing, persistent, and intense gunfire incidents where um, an individual might not ever be hit. And so that, that's a really big problem. And I think if we understood uh, better the downstream consequences of what it means to be traumatized because you're exposed to this level of gun violence, um, our hair would literally be on fire about the issue of ongoing persistent gun violence, particularly, again, in uh, at-risk, underserved uh, communities. We sometimes talk about this vicarious victimization after a mass shooting event, when, um, and these are very tragic events, to be sure, and we're talking to uh, children that are, you know, that survive these events, but dealing with the trauma of just being exposed to that event in that one particular instance. And, and I know there's a lot of conversations out there around what it means in terms of the perceived uh, level of safety in a, in a classroom. I can tell you in uh, communities like Baltimore, Oakland, uh, Kansas City, you pick it, Miami Gardens, these are small, medium, large cities. A lot of students uh, in at-risk, underserved communities feel the safest place for them to be is in a classroom. But getting to and from their classroom, to, from their home, is really, really quite challenging. And, this, this point was really made for me, actually, uh, when I first joined the company about um, eight and a half years ago when I did have the opportunity to do a ride-along in um, Baltimore. And um, it, these are supposed to be fairly um, innocuous events where they're you know, taking someone like me in a suit, driving around and you know, it, you know, showing me what's what. And there was a call uh, because there was a homicide and they needed some additional resources there to control the, the scene. So this individual that was taking me along, had to reluctantly kind of take me to this particular event, which I was actually pretty excited about because I'm in the business of gun violence uh, reduction and prevention through our technology. And I was girding myself for um, what I was going to see because of course I'd never witnessed uh, personally a homicide even though I grew up in uh, Oakland, California. And when we got to the scene, there was a young man there, probably uh, no, no older than 14 years old, um, laying in the middle of the street. And I thought that was gonna be the thing that was most upsetting to me. But actually, what was most upsetting to me was to see the non-reaction of young people around the scene. It was like nothing had ever happened. 
And I just thought about my children, um, and I've got four kids. If they ever had been exposed to someone, one of their friends possibly, laying in the middle of the street, um, shot dead, uh, it, was a, it was a head wound as well, I mean, that would have like completely uh, freaked them out. They wouldn't have been able to sleep at night. And yet these kids were just kind of going about their normal business, you know, riding their bicycles, skipping ropes, the, the whole nine yards. And that is the cost of gun violence. And we, haven't, our, we, we don't have a, a really good way to um, uh, put a number on that, but I've got to believe inherently that that has all manner of downstream negative consequences in terms of you know, graduation, matricul matriculation uh, rates from high school, um, you know, testing, uh, teenage pregnancies, drug use, alcohol use, uh, the whole nine yards. And if we ever put a number on that, again, this will be something that we would pay much more attention to. And there's a lot more empathy, I think, we would have with these victims that typically when you talk about a homicide victim uh, in uh, these communities, oftentimes they're young black males. Um, sometimes it involves, um, it's very hard to distinguish in our own minds, I think, um, the victim from the perpetrator because they might have been both in gangs or whatever. And we, we tend to uh, make the victim a perpetrator in the same sentence. So it's very easy for us to have a little bit of an arm's length distance on this particular, uh, particular issue and not get emotionally connected. But I think if you, you know, realize that there was a child that uh, had to go to bed to the sound of gunfire, wake up to the sound of gunfire, maybe walk across yellow tape on their way to school, I think we would think about this issue uh, very differently. One thing that interests me is a lot of the political and policy conversation around guns is about different kinds of restrictions, about trying to limit who are the people that can get guns, but also trying to limit, you know, perhaps we should have an assault weapon ban or a ban on certain features of guns to try to improve the safety situation. Can you differentiate, you know, because I feel like none of you guys are really advocating for that, and, and the smart gun is, is different than that. What, why do you think that, that it's a better approach or a better place to focus your efforts? I think it's hard, um, given um, our Second Amendment rights, the way people feel about them. I think the... Um, um, the, um, the, the difficulty of, uh, of letting go of that, because it's a right that's being taken away. I think it's hard for um, the NRA to let something like that go. I think if you could ensure that Second Amendment rights would not be um, affected, um, you'd probably have a huge growth in technology and the ability to actually get a proper smart gun fixed and working and out there that people would buy. Um, right now, I think the big fear is our rights are going to be taken away. Remember, um, gun owners, generally speaking, uh, at this stage, um, if you're going to buy your gun the first time, you want to make sure that it shoots because you're buying it for protection if it's your first gun. And um, so smart guns, unless they're totally proven, are probably not going to get much traction. However, if you could assure the NRA and you could, policymakers didn't focus on this track of taking away Second Amendment rights, I think you'd have a lot of development there. I mean, the other way to do it is the industry doesn't want to develop it, but if you had a private-public partnership where maybe funding came partially for, from the government with the help of some of the larger companies and make it open source, you then might get some buy-in people might make something up. But once again, it all depends on once this is out, what's it going to do to our rights? I think that's where people are thinking. And we're, we're working with some organizations to develop incentive-based legislation because, as Donald mentioned before, there's the New Jersey mandate that mandates the technology. Um, we're hoping that's actually going to be amended this month um, to say that um, instead of all guns sold in the state of New Jersey has to have to be a smart gun. Uh, the amendment states that when a smart gun comes to market, an, an FFL, a licensed firearm dealer, has to offer one for sale. That's the compromise legislation because we couldn't get it repealed. Um, but in the interim, we've been working on incentive legislation because what we've learned is that legislators like to legislate, so we have to give them something and move them away from mandates to more incentive-based legislation. So we are, uh, we're coming out with things like tax credits and grants for the development of these technologies so that um, 
gun companies are incentivized to develop um, these technologies rather than having them forced down their throat. Whether or not that will work um, is still, you know, TBD, but at least it's moving it in the right direction so the NRA can't say, you know, you're mandating them. Here we're putting it, trying to put incentives in place. But it's, it's an uphill battle. I actually want to say one more thing. When we were starting with our, our smart gun, we actually had one developed, we got huge resistance from gun control um, lobbies. They, those people who didn't believe that people should have guns, period, were very against smart guns because they thought that would cause a proliferation of smart guns and you'd have this sort of boom in gun ownership that came out of that. So we got major resistance from them. It was as bad as what we got from the NRA. Um, so it's, and, it's very interesting to watch. And that hasn't changed. I mean, no. fast forward almost 20 years and it's still the same. So both ends of the spectrum, like many issues, um, there's not a lot of common ground, uh, whereas we really believe these technologies represent a way to bridge the gap. It allows gun owners to ha have a firearm that has some technology that gives them an, an enhanced safety features and helps prevent misuse. Yeah, and I think I'll just say, fortunately for us, I think everyone could agree that the criminal use of guns is an awful bad thing. I mean, in fact, the NRA's moniker is, you know, it's not guns that kill people, it's bad guys with guns that kill people. And I mean, sadly, there's, there's a significant element of truth in that statement. Um, and and the, the things that we're talking about when we talk about smart guns, I think they have very little impact, not intended to have impact, but very little impact on the criminal use of guns. And I think we're very fortunate in that we're pretty simple minded as a company. Our focus is extremely narrow and it's really about the criminal use of guns in cities, small, medium, and large cities that have these issues that are ongoing and persistent, and they can only be addressed at the local level. So there's no magic, um, I would say, of federal legislation that can change the behavior of the very few serial trigger pullers that are out there that are driving most of the gun crime in these you know, 500 plus cities uh, in, in the U.S. It really has to be about local intervention. And they're just not local law enforcement interventions. I think you can have carrot interventions as well. And that's why I'm really supportive of the idea of um, uh, programs like Ceasefire and the like that tries to identify these serial trigger pullers and try to give them a path to basically put the gun down. At the end of the day, what we want to do in our particular case is denormalize uh, gun violence and give a community tools to be able to focus with a high degree of precision on the people that are generating the problem. And to do anything else is, I think, a bit of a wasted uh, resource if you're worried about the issue of uh, criminal uh, gun use in communities. So, Donald, I know that one of the problems that you had with your smart gun was a problem of the sort of reliability of the technology. And, uh, you know, that makes sense to me that that might be discouraging of people. You don't want to buy a gun that's not going to perform for you when you need it. Um, so how much better is the technology now? How close are we to having something that you could convince a gun owner who's, who, or a gun buyer who wants to protect themselves using a weapon that when they really need the gun, you know, there will be these safety features, but also it will work? I think you're probably closer to that. Uh, guns jam, even, you know, conventional guns jam. So that's a problem. But where the technologies have gone to since I'm, I no longer own Colt, I sold it um, several years ago, about five years ago. Um, I can't tell you where it's progressed, but you can. So the technology has clearly advanced. Um, as, as we all know, technology goes through pretty rapid um, evolution cycles, and they're only increasing um, in speed. So RFID has been around 40 plus years and is incredibly reliable, and that hasn't changed a lot. Um, and uh, one of the advantages of an RFID gun is that it's impervious to water, dirt, and you can wear gloves, and, and the gun will still shoot. You just have to have a token, whether that's a, a watch, a bracelet, a ring. You could even theoretically embed a chip in your hand, and then the gun um, would fire. And we kind of all go, oh my god, that seems a little scary, but if you think about today, um, there's a company that's developing um, RFID, using RFID technology to go to um, 
the, um, oh gosh, t uh, vending machine. So you can buy your candy bar with an embedded chip in your hand and just go like that. And the candy bar j drops and there you go. So although we in this room may feel that that's a bit far-fetched, probably fast forward 10 years from now, that's probably not gonna be a crazy concept. On the biometric side, we all use um, fingerprint technology in our, on our smartphones and that technology is quickly advancing. There's three different types, op optical, capacitive, capacitive, which is the, the type that's mostly used right now, but there's a new technology using ultra, ultrasonic technology that actually is 3D and can really map the <coughs> fingerprint and is, um, and can deal with water and grease and, and less than ideal conditions. Um, right now, that scanner is still expensive, but as we know, over time the cost comes down and they'll be proven to be more reliable and we'll see them. I know Qualcomm is looking at putting them into some smartphones. Um, so the technology is getting there, but no matter what technology, whether it's RFID or biometric or potentially something else down the road, these guns will have to go through testing uh, to prove reliability. You know, as as Donald said, there's no such thing as a gun that does that that doesn't fail. All guns have some element of that, but they need to be proven to be as reliable as a conventional gun. And so they will have to go through testing. And ideally, law enforcement can do some piloting and testing to give the um, public some confidence in their abilities to you know, work and, and save lives. So that's a very important point. Um, people generally like to buy the handguns that policemen own. If the police don't get behind the smart guns when they are developed, it'll be very hard to get the general consumer to pick it up. So, I'm just, so. Police are early adopters. I can tell you that. <laughs> they are. are like the last to adopt. Right. Exactly so. But I would also argue, and I definitely agree with that statement, I mean, we, de we definitely need law enforcement to at least pilot it and test it. Um, but I think because this is also a technology play, there's always a segment um, of the population. I use the analogy of the guy who sleeps outside the Apple store the night before, the, the, you know, the next iPhone's going to be released. Um, there will be that gun owner who wants the latest and greatest technology because there are a segment of gun owners that buy guns because they're cool and they're, I hate, I don't, I don't like to use this term, but you know, it's like a cool new gadget, a cool new toy that um, they want to go to the range and, and shoot with. And that's, that's essentially what ARs are. Um, and so smart guns will appeal to a demographic that just wants the latest and greatest technology. That's not necessarily broad adoption, but those will be your early adopters. It strikes me that this is a technology that theoretically has the ability to have broad appeal because it's not about taking anyone's gun away, but it is about improving the safety of guns. But I also am hearing from the history that actually uh, that same feature has made it easily attacked from both sides. Um, I'm just wondering how you guys think about the political climate now and the kind of market climate, you know? Like, is there is this a moment where there could be acceptance of this technology? Is this a moment where you could imagine gun purchasers and gun dealers wanting to sell such a product if it existed? And gun manufacturers wanting to stick their neck out and be the first to do it? I think from the standpoint of the manufacturer's stand, but there's, they just, it's not a big enough market. There's too much controversy around it. Uh, and there's still too much pushback from all sides. Not only that, but I think Washington and lawmakers, uh, policymakers have really not, they have a very confused approach. And until that's really sort of focused, I think it'll be very hard for the manufacturers to get behind it. I also agree, it, it's gonna be a tough battle with the manufacturers and I think I actually think the primary reason is the reticence to get back to try it again because of being the fear of being boycotted Correct. and the fear of going out of business. Um, that's that to me is the the deal breaker for them. I think if there was a company that went to market first and took the silver bullet, um, 
and broke through the market, I think they would follow because the thing about smart guns, it's a new category. So if you look at it from a pure business standpoint, this is a product line extension, uh, appeals to a new demographic. Their existing customer base is getting old. They need to attract new customers. They want to, their growth segment currently is are women. And so these technologies appeal to women because they can't be overpowered and have the firearm used against them. And they protect their children because if there's a firearm in the house, then their children can't get hold of it. So you're looking at product line extension, new customers, and potential new sources of revenue, which currently are down because when you've got someone like Trump or a Republican in the White House, gun sales go down. When you have a, a Democrat in the office or when anyone threatens to do anything with firearms, gun sales go up. So um, I would argue that if you could get over the hurdle, um, that it would be good for their business. But I don't think any of them are going to get jump in the game anytime soon. Remember, gun companies are not selling more guns. They're selling fewer guns. So their job is to make their customers happy. So until smart gun technology makes their customers happy, there's not going to be. If you had a new company that, as you said, that was focused on a smart gun, that was an American company, and that was willing to sell it, I mean, create their own distribution. Because you know, the fact is, retailers and gun merchants can't sell smart guns at this point. I would argue Dick's Sporting Goods, Dick's who we actually have spoken with, they might. Yeah. are open to um, selling. Um, but the tide, I, the one thing that's slightly different now is Parkland. I mean, those kids went through a horrible experience but one of the positive things that have come out of it is that you've got these kids who have an unbelievable voice and passion for seeing change, for seeing solutions that make the world safer for other kids and for society. And um, they're not scared of politicians. They're not scared of anybody at this point. And I think they actually have the potential to help accelerate change, because this has been, change has been slow in coming. But they're all about looking at new ways to make um, our world safer when it comes to firearms. And so, you know, if it wasn't for them, Dix probably would never have said no more ARs are going to be sold. And, and the corporate sponsors um, that have dropped the NRA are partially because of them. And then you see Larry Fink from BlackRock putting pressure on Smith & Wesson and the nuns who put um, pressure on Sturm Ruger saying you've got to do something around safety. These things I believe, and, I, and granted I've been drinking the Kool-Aid way too long, but um, I think it's not a question of when. I mean, not a question of if, it's a question of when. And the other thing, and I'm monopolizing, but real quickly, right now we've been spending all this time on smart guns, but there's some amazing uh, trigger locks and gun safes that are accessories that aren't controversial, that have these technologies that also have the potential to save lives. And these are the ones that will lead the charge because they're just cool gun safes and trigger locks that you can have your loaded firearm sitting there on your kitchen counter on your bed and your kid can't get it. It's secured. Um, so those are the technologies that we, we are seeing and we will continue to see in the short term that hopefully will turn into smart guns down the road. So I want to make sure we have some time for questions. Um, you guys have been here for a day now, so you mostly know the drill. Wait for a microphone. Um, say who you are, and because we have, time is a little bit tight, make sure it's a nice, tight question. Uh, over here. Um, given the patty gas on Denver, um, <laughs> about Denver, um, given the issues about differential policing that uh, we've seen um, in the cities where you are putting this uh, technology to uh, find 
where a gun has been shot. Can you demonstrate that the police respond more to those neighborhoods and there have been more convictions of these uh, perpetual shooters? Yeah, so great question. So I'll repeat the question. Um, uh, where we've deployed, I presume the question was directed to me, um, where we've deployed shots by our technology, what kind of evidence-based outcomes have we seen in terms of police response and uh, um, reductions in gun violence, I imagine, is what, and convictions and, and the like. And, you know, so uh, anecdotally, we see a lot. Uh, we've measured um, uh, some degree of um, our customers that have deployed and looked at it on a year-over-year -year basis to get a true comparison. And we've seen uh, something on order of 35% median reductions in, um, uh, in gun violence events or discharges, criminal discharges of guns. Uh, a part of our business is also providing um, uh, evidentiary, um, uh, forensically sound evidence that can be presented in court cases as a part of uh, prosecutions. And we've uh, stood up against Kelly Fry and uh, survived uh, Daubert uh, challenges and the like. So the data is um, uh, court uh, verified and uh, tested. But I, I guess I'm going to also say that that's almost a little bit of the wrong question to ask, because to me it starts with the idea of what should elicit a response. And without showing any reductions or prosecutions or anything of the like, the fundamental question I would ask is, is a community deserving of a police response? And if we know that guns are fired on the order of some communities um, 500 times uh, per year per square mile, that's the level of intensity of gun violence that we see. Um, and they're not reported 80 to 90 percent of the time, which means there's no police response. Um, that's fundamentally wrong. And I don't think we have to uh, use reductions in burglaries to uh, justify having burglar, burglar alarms on our house or getting police to respond to burglar alarm requests. It's just a fundamental right that when something like that happens in my community, I deserve a response. And if there are reductions, great. If there's prosecutions, that's fantastic too. But the first thing is getting the response and being accountable to the problem. And a bit of the challenge I think we have, frankly, in uh, adoption is getting a, uh, elected officials and uh, police departments to be prepared to deal with the inconvenient truth of what happens in a lot of communities. And we become a very unambiguous thermometer of that, and we're the truth teller on that too. And so when you have shot spotter, you might get the question, you know, chief, mayor, you know, what are we doing about these, you know, 1,500 events that have happened in this three square mile area? And that could be a little bit uncomfortable. And fortunately for us, the, the agencies that we're able to lean in with on this take a very comprehensive approach to gun violence prevention and reduction and use ShotSpotter as a tool along with other tools to be effective in the issue of um, addressing gun <coughs> violence, both from a response point of view as well as a prevention and reduction point of view. Uh, here in the front, I know you're going to compliment the panel on being not emotional, but very objective. Which was very encouraging to, to hear. Now, one of the interesting questions was, how do we get Washington and the elected representatives to be that way? In other words, to, be, to really understand and not emotional, <laughs> and then go ahead and make a vote that's an emotional vote because of their, they want to get reelected. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I've been trying to get to that point for a long time, and I haven't found a solution. But if you've got one, please help us. <laughs> Here in the front. Um, I got two questions. Uh, one is on Shot Spotter. Is that a system, and what does the system cost, and why isn't it mandated? Uh, one, two. What's a real smart gun? Can't you put a chip in a gun that identify where it is and how many times it's been shot, and you can't buy this gun unless. You know, that's really a violation of rights, but it would tell you everything about who that gun owner is. Well, you go first. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, why isn't it mandated? Um, uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. I think uh, that might be a bit unfair to mandate something like this. What we would like to see at the federal level is uh, more financial resources available for cities that want to go lean in on this particular issue. Um, I think, What's the cost? oh, so the cost. So we, um, we charge an annual subscription fee of $65,000 to $85,000 per square mile per year. So, and we won't do anything smaller than three square miles. So the investment could be as little as $200,000 a year for a city 
or in the case of Chicago, where we have over 100 square miles uh, deployed, that's something on the order of like $5 million a year. New York City has about 70 square miles. Uh, they're paying about five, I know, I think about three and a half million dollars a year, but they have a very expansive uh, area. So uh, extremely affordable from our, from our point of view. And um, uh, the, the impact is very large too, because when you hear a lot in policing that talks about community engagement, um, you can't have community engagement and you can't have um, uh, uh, trust and legitimacy in a community, uh, community's eyes and not show up to 80 to 90% of gunfire incidents, but at the very same time arrest kids for uh, carrying marijuana sticks the way you wouldn't do if those kids were at Georgetown University. And if you ever want to look at some interesting data, it's a little bit off topic with respect to gun violence, but you talk about the variability of um, police response and uh, 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 inclusion is you look at marijuana arrests in the city of DC on a heat map and you'll see all manner of dark spots all around and you'll see this very light spot in the middle and that's Georgetown University where of course no one smokes marijuana, <laughs> right? Has, has run out, I'm gonna not answer the last question, or the second question, but I wanna thank all of you guys for being here. I thank our panelists for really uh, educating us about something I didn't know very much about, uh, and that is quite interesting. I have to run because I'm moderating another panel in a few minutes, but um, <laughs> my panelists said that they would stay for a few minutes if, if people wanna come up and ask more questions. Thank you.